you know, the, the, this disjuncture between the productive hub of the world economy, which is now so clearly centred on East Asia, and that's what the CO2 numbers tell you. So that's where all the physical activity is going on. You know, China, I don't know whether you've seen this stat, but China poured more concrete between 20... 50% more concrete between 2011 and 2013 than the United States poured in the entire 20th century. Um, right. And that coincides with a monetary system which, as you rightly say, is, continues to be centred on the dollar. Uh, one of the ways we thought this would go down is that 2008 would be the moment where the dollar hegemony broke. Right? That was the simple story we all had that made life really easy for us. In fact, I have a slide showing it. That's the way we thought 2008 would work out. That's the economist from 2007, fall of 2007. Right? And that, that's the opposite of what happened. It turned out that every bank in the world desperately needed dollars and the Fed was on hand to provide them. And so every bank in the world got the message that if you want to conduct currency, you want to conduct business in a global currency, if you do it in dollars, you're in good hands. They know how to manage this system. Um, and China is, in fact, if anything, more and more hooked on it, and, and, and in the sense that rather than internationalizing China, China's privates, uh, uh, businesses have taken advantage of cheap dollar funding in the way everyone else has. And so the extraordinary thing happened in 2015-16, which is the opposite of 2008, which is a huge hemorrhage of funds out of China. Uh, and this was a moment in which China, therefore, became dependent on cooperation from Janet Yellen's Fed uh, in 2016. And... Um, and uh, it, Powell is doing them a solid right now in postponing the rise of interest rates because we know how dicey things look in China at this moment. So it, there was a vision in which it looked as though they got it, right? The Fed understood the role. It couldn't openly say or too openly say that we are the guardians of a global financial system because it is an institution answerable to a national parliament. It is a national monetary system and the, con the nationalists are on the warpath. And the Chinese could rely on assistance from them. And now, of course, we have a president who, you know, eagerly tweets about the collapse of the Shanghai stock market as evidence for the fact that he's winning the trade war. That, that, is not, that is not the ideal scenario. But cooperation goes on. I think it's remarkable the way to which Powell, as Fed chair, has, in fact, continued to, to do this, uh, to, to, in fact, conduct a policy which is cooperative. I mean, it plays into the accusation from several people that this is top-down history. Uh, but one of the ways in which it was explained that Yellen and the Fed was taking this position was that the, the Fed board included Stanley Fisher in 1516, who was formerly the, uh, the head of the Israeli Central Bank. Um, so it, in fact, integrated an emerging market banker uh, as a member of the American Policymaking Committee. And America being a multi-ethnic society, you can imagine how you play this out. I mean, it's an absurd vision of how you organize global governance by means of the incorporation of diasporic elites into American policymaking, because it seems like it's the only way you get out of the impasse of having a global system dependent on a national actor. I mean, it's a mad, a, really, you know, it's kind of a reductio ad absurdum of the elite nature of this kind of politics. Um, I don't know how, it, how we progress uh, from there. And, and I think it's a constant, you know, that is the excitement of watching financial markets, if, you might, if I might put it so glibly, uh, and the current moment is precisely road testing that scenario. Climate change, climate change, I was going to say another version of this talk. I mean, the one way of making the connection is, you know, America got into global governance in the Wilsonian movement over what they took to be what they understood as the existential question of total war. That was the driver, right? And Wilson's mission, and one should credit him with this, was attempting to ban that. In the name of all that was holy, every human value insisted that America should stay outside this. He described it as a, it would be a crime against civilization for America, the great white power, he emphatically understood it that way, to allow itself to be sucked into Europe's war and to win it for Britain and France. A crime against civilization, no less. Um, and there are moments in the Cold War where, after all, the emergence of this American hyperpower and its counterpart in the Soviet Union created moments of absolutely existential threat for humanity. And it's difficult, I think, to convey for those who didn't live through it. I only experienced the 1980s version. My parents lived through the 1960s Cuban Missile Crisis, 
it really did seem as though not just something bad was going to happen, but the entire, I mean, you were talking about moments of peril that we face now. I think the Cuban Missile Crisis was worse. Like, bad as Brexit is, that really did look like the end of the world. And I, I remember how terrified we were living in West Germany about Ronald Reagan. It looked as though we were in the hands of a madman, or at least somebody who was a buffoon, who had his finger on the button. And, and that produced a move back, right? It produced a move towards ordering, uh, reordering. But it, thinking about the geometry of it, it's, it's such a simple problem. It is an elite problem. It's centered at the very highest levels of governance. It is on the one hand humanity's fate and on the other hand decision making by a tiny elite locked into extraordinarily refined mechanisms thinking about deterrence and how it works and how it doesn't work. The climate change problem is so much more complex and yet on the basis of the IPCC report of this fall, how, last fall, how can we deny the fact that it's, they're telling us we have no excuse for not thinking that this is not an apocalyptic threat to hundreds of millions of people? Um, and yet, you know, everything around us in this hall right now is shaped and implicit and, in, and implicated in the carbon civilization that is causing that problem. The lights shining on me right now, the computer, every, all the clothes that we're wearing, every way in which we got here, the number of flights I've taken since the beginning of the year. Like, everything is implicated in it. So it's a decision for transformation which is massively more radical. Um, and so I think it poses, it absolutely poses, the question was simply, does it pose unique problems of governance? I mean, you bet you. I mean, it, it, it requires an upheaving of the entire material foundations of our civilization since the 19th century, since the 18th century. Um, and most fundamentally of all, and this is the really difficult thing, and I mean it absolutely seriously, it is no longer our problem to decide. That is, you know, as many adorable Scandinavian teenagers as we can mobilize, it will not make a damn bit of difference. This is not our question. We started it, we started the ball rolling, much of the CO2 out there, we put there, but if the question is how do we control it in the next 20 to 30 years, nothing we do makes a fundamental difference. We should do our part. We should pioneer those technologies. We should be generous in technology transfer, the opposite of where we're at with the 5G struggle. Um, but it is their emissions that decide this. And those emissions are their aspirations to an approximation of a decent material, what we take for granted as a decent material standard of living. Right? So it poses the most fundamental question to the nation-state projects of the two largest countries on Earth, India and China. They have to somehow square it with their own politics as to how they figure out. And we know what the decisions are. It's basically about the decision of China and India to use coal-fired power plants. That's the critical issue. Uh, and that in India is a regional decision. <laughs> that will be made province by province across India. Um, so that, I think, is the other way in which, to me, you know, we really need to step back. America acts as our surrogate as Westerners. It's a way in which we think agency. I mean, this is the, you know, why Varoufakis could invoke the New Deal. Even for him, it stands as a moment of agency. Greece, after all, was a major recipient of Marshall Plan aid. Like, we feel part of that drama. The biggest adjustment we have to make in thinking about climate change is that we are provincial. We are, we are bystanders uh, in what will decide the fate of humanity.